Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the scientist.com Inside Scientific and Sinobiological webinar. I'm Liam Samuel from scientist.com, and I'm pleased to be your host for this event. Today, I'm being joined by Dr. Yuning Chen, R&D Manager at Sinobiological. And without any further ado, I'll hand things over to Dr. Yuning Chen. Yuning, thanks so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuning Chen. I'm currently a R&D manager at Sinobiological. Uh, today, we're going to talk about recombinant antibodies, what they are, and how are they made. So I would like to uh, structure my seminar into these four parts. So uh, first, I would like to give a quick preview of overview of our company, and then we're going to move on to talk about recombinant antibodies, um, their derivatives, and the strategies involved in their expression. And last but not least, I would like to um, uh, quickly uh, touch bases on a novel high-throughput expression platforms uh, that we have established to help uh, create antibody libraries. So, uh, company overview, Sinobiological was founded in 2007. Uh, our headquarter uh, is currently situated in Beijing, China. And uh, as you can see from this map, uh, we have uh, offices uh, in North America, Europe, uh, Japan, and also some other uh, locations in China. So basically, we're everywhere. Um, and uh, we, uh, the, the company has more than 500 employees at this moment. And we, uh, our facilities has been certified by both uh, domestic, the domestic as well as international agencies. Um, our core business involves reagent and customer services. Uh, our reagent uh, ranging from genes, proteins, uh, antibodies, as well as ELISA kits. So we have uh, uh, created a significant library of these uh, uh, biochemical reagents to facilitate uh, biomedical research as well as uh, drug development. So our products are uh, used by uh, researchers in over 90 countries and uh, I think they're well received uh, as you can see from this uh, citation chart with it, which is uh, on an upper trajectory. And besides our um, product pipeline, we also uh, offer uh, contract contracted research services to um, organization uh, to uh, research institutes as well as bio biopharmaceutical companies. Uh, so what we offer mainly is to use our recombinant expression platform to uh, help you prepare recombinant proteins as well as recombinant antibodies, uh, which you will hear a lot during this talk. And uh, we also have an antibody generation platform um, that we use different techniques such as mouse hybridoma or other um, library construction methods such as phage display or single B cell sorting technique uh, to help identify uh, antibodies of desired functionalities. So um, that was the uh, uh, quick introduction of Sinobiological. And if you're interested in our company, I would encourage you to visit our website. And now let's move on to our main course of the day, which is to talk about uh, antibodies and uh, uh, their derivatives, what they are. And then we will talk about strategies of uh, how to produce these uh, antibody constructs using recombinant expression. Um, so I, um, I'm a protein biochemist and not an immunologist, so I would forego this, um, the, the detailed explaining of this chart of how antibodies are made. But essentially antibodies are secreted by uh, matured B cells. They're essentially sentinel molecules uh, circulating in our bloodstream. Um, they can interact with a uh, particular um, on a particular part of an antigen with high specificity as well as strong affinity and so these are the features that actually make the antibodies very appealing and bear the um, the name of a magic bullet and uh, that is also why they're <clears throat> i think one of the major reasons why you know the uh, they're the focus of a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies and they are i think they're considered as the uh, foundation of modern bio uh, pharmaceuticals 
So in our body, there are um, in our blood circulation, there are five different types of anti uh, five different subclasses of antibodies. Um, they're mainly categorized by the chemical nature of their heavy chain. Uh, antibodies do share um, light chains, which comes in either a kappa formation or a lambda formation. Okay. So um, <clears throat> among these five uh, antibody uh, antibody sub uh, subtypes, um, IgG is the most abundant, followed by uh, IgM and IgA, and we only have a small amount of IgD and IgEs in our uh, circulating our bloodstream. Uh, so for the IgG format, it can be further categorized based on the uh, sequence of the constant region as well as the the length of the hinge region. Um, into uh, these four subtypes, and uh, among which I think IgG1 and IgG4 are the main formats that are used in uh, biopharmaceuticals. And we also have uh, unique formats of antibodies. So, for instance, uh, LAMA and other uh, chemicals can generate single domain antibodies, which is comprised of, of only uh, one heavy chain. And there are antibodies called IgY in the uh, egg yolk, which uh, has a uh, rather complicated uh, FC domain. So um, I think the field of immunology and antibody can be traced all the way back into um, into the 1700s, and this uh, this field has been uh, developed for over 300 years. Um, <clears throat> but I think. Uh, up to 1975, when the hybridoma technology was invented, this film took a exponential growth uh, and create uh, and generates more and more uh, therapeutic antibodies to, that adds to the arsenal to fight either cancer or uh, infectious diseases as well as other uh, type of diseases such as autoimmune disorders as well. So every develop uh, the development of every new piece of technology resulted in um, the addition of novel antibodies into the into the pipeline. Uh, I think up to 2022, up to this year, there are over 135 antibody therapeutics. They're either approved or in the regulatory reviews, review stage. And with the rise of artificial intelligence, I think there will be more and more antibodies uh, to, to be developed and uh, approved in the in the future. And among these uh, previously proved antibodies, you can see uh, several of them are among the top 10 drugs uh, in terms of their global cell by, 1920, uh, by 2019. So antibody, it's not only uh, the antibody development, it's not only a, technology, a technological challenge, but it is also a highly rewarded business. So I think that's why uh, a lot of um, big pharmaceutical companies are uh, invested heavily into this uh, into this field. So, like I mentioned earlier, antibodies are actually very specific and uh, uh, highly selective to their uh, specific targets. So that det determines that uh, they can be used either as therapeutics, like I mentioned earlier, or as core reagents in diagnostic uh, assay tools, um, and also their uh, really valuable tools for uh, biochemical biomedical research and uh, can be used in different type of, of uh, immunological assays such as western blot immunofluorescence uh, immunohistochemistry and so on um, these antibodies help us uh, either quantify or track the location of the target that we are interested in uh, and here I would like to also take this opportunity to give a quick shout out of this uh, new anti-clouding 18.2 uh, antibody that we have developed recently. Uh, it is a uh, immunohistochemistry uh, applicable antibody, and it perform it outperforms the uh, I think the current versions of the commercial uh, clouding 18.2 antibodies as well. So if you're interested, uh, I think you can request for a small sample um, from us. And uh, I will have the contact information on the last slide of this presentation. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. So antibodies are useful. Um, they can do a lot of things, um, but they all 
they all bear a uh, several key regions that you know carries out these functions. Uh, one of the most, I, w I would say, the most important region would be the variable region. Um, it is comprised by a combination of six uh, uh, complementary determined regions (CDRs) on both heavy chain and light chain. You know, these uh, CDRs forms this paratope that interacts with the epitopes on an antigen, and uh, the FC domain, of course, also uh, carries out its biological functions, which we will mention. Uh, we will mention later. <clears throat> Uh, but everything actually starts with uh, with a sequence of the variable regions. Once you have that, we can do a lot of engineering, as well as and to, to convert uh, a full length IgG into different formats. So depending on where you obtain your uh, variable region sequence, so if your antibody was derived from a hybridoma culture, uh, you can take the cells, um, extract the mRNA encoding the uh, antibody sequence, and and then we can perform you know next generation sequencing, and piece out uh, you know piece together the um, the sequence of of the CDR regions to to create uh, to generate. Um, this uh, to decode this variable region, uh, but if you were using a you know other type of uh, discovery process, for instance uh, phage display or B cell sorting, uh, then you will have you know after the panning process you will have sequences to begin with, so that will uh, make things a lot easier. Well, somehow easier. Uh, so once we have this, uh, the amino acid sequence or the gene sequence of the uh, antibody, uh, the variable region available, uh, we can convert them into you know different formats. I listed a few formats here. Uh, these I think are the most common uh, formats of recombinant antibodies. Uh, so the first one is of course uh, fragmented antibodies, which means we can take the variable region and try to you know miniaturize them into either the FAP. Or a single chain FV version of the antibody, uh, and we can also graft a uh, the variable region of one antibody onto the framework of a second antibody, and we can also uh, uh, fuse SCFV or VHH, you know these uh, smaller uh, antibody variants onto a FC to enhance their uh, serum stability. And lastly, I would also uh, I would like to uh, mention um, uh, with the uh, you know variable regions of one antibody, two antibody, or so even a few antibodies, uh, we can try to put them together and to create bispecific, or tri-specific, or multi-specific antibodies uh, using uh, protein engineering technique. So here I listed um, several formats of bispecific antibodies. Uh, that are uh, that we have encountered uh, during the during the years from uh, our uh, customer services, but for a uh, more comprehensive review of you know what bispecific antibodies are and what kind of formats they're in, uh, this is actually a very good review. I've listed the uh, uh, the reference here. If you're interested, you, you should definitely uh, check out this uh, this review paper. Now we've uh, touched briefly on the formats of um, different antibodies and know a little bit about you know where uh, they come from. And now we would like to I would like to spend some time talk about how we can uh, create these uh, different formats of antibodies uh, using recombinant expression the ex recombinant expression technique. <clears throat> So since we're trying to make a recombinant version of your antibody, so uh, it still bear uh, it still adapts to the whole recombinant protein expression, you know, central dogma, if you will. So basically, we take a target gene. Um, in this case, the gene or genes that encodes your uh, antibody of choice, and we insert them into an expression vector, and then we Figure out a way to transfer these expression vectors into a host cell, and we let the host cells do its magic to um, create a crude protein or antibody preparation, and then we can <clears throat> extract the uh, antibody of interest from the mixture uh, using um, 
uh, purification techniques. So uh, common host cells used for recombinant protein expressions are listed here. Uh, each of them has their characteristics and they have them have their you know pros and cons, if you will. <clears throat> and we routinely use all these uh, platforms for recombinant protein expression. Uh, but in order to make a uh, recombinant antibody, the first thing that we need to do is to select a suitable host to do this job um, because uh, the host, host cells are very important um, so that it, the selection of a suitable host will um, largely impact um, the success of your recombinant either protein or antibody expression project. So, in order to select a host cell or the most host cell for recombinant antibodies, uh, we would need to take a closer look at the antibody molecules. So, first of all, there are secreted proteins, which means um, they need to be uh, uh, secreted out to into the culture media uh, in order to be purified. And antibodies themselves have very complex high order structures and they have multiple disulfide bounds in the in the sequence, not only in the hinge region, but also uh, in the constant region as well. So we need to make sure that they're correctly formed. And the, the correct folding of both the variable region and the constant region are important uh, for their for its functionalities. So the corrected folded variable region is <clears throat> crucial for antigen interaction, while that of the FC region is re uh, important for uh, the FC receptor interaction as well as the, its downstream effector uh, functions. And antibodies are glycomolecules and they bear glycans that are important for the stability and their functionality. So we would want these glycans to be present in the mature molecule as well. So <clears throat> to uh, put, the, put the, all these factors together, um, it is sensible to choose uh, mammalian cell systems such as HEC-293 or CHO cells uh, to, use, uh, to serve as the uh, expression host for recombinant antibodies. Uh, however, <clears throat> Uh, I think in the literature, uh, there are all reports indicating you can use either E. coli or yeast to serve as hosts for the expression of uh, especially VHH type of antibodies. So here I listed a uh, reference here, which they, <coughs> I think the authors took, uh, took advantage of a uh, HLY uh, secretion system of uh, E. coli, and they created this, you know, secreted form of VHH uh, fusion protein. So this is one way to um, produce VHH in E. coli. Uh, but I think m the majority of the recombinant proteins are produced, or uh, recombinant antibodies, sorry, are produced using uh, mammalian cell culture systems. So once we have the uh, antibody sequence, uh, it can be derived from uh, antibody discovery campaigns uh, from uh, using different techniques. Um, once we have the sequence, um, um, we can uh, put them into expression vector and uh, carry out a, a small scale or transient, expect, uh, transient expression experiment uh, and, uh, and uh, um, collect several antibodies to test. And once we determine you know, which one or ones, we would like to uh, proceed to uh, a larger scale manufacturing, uh, we can then try to uh, you know, create a stable cell lines and uh, to optimize the uh, culture and purification protocols to achieve larger scale manufacturing. Um, in this talk, we will uh, I will not cover the discovery part as well as the stable cell line part. Um, they, there uh, can be a stories for another time. Uh, but rather, I would like to focus on um, you know this central um, this central process <clears throat> um, that starts with the antibody sequences and all the way to um, uh, antibody purification and uh, uh, activity assessment. So briefly, um, once the antibodies or uh, the sequences are obtained, they're cloned into different expression vectors. And, you, and usually, if you want to express a full-length antibody, we use two vectors. Uh, but 
depending on the, uh, the the actual format of the antibody, it can be uh, two vectors, one vector, or sometimes even more more than two vectors. And the vectors are transfected into the host cells using uh, this PEI mediated and um, transfection, and the the cells harboring the uh, expression vectors or undergo culture in different scales um, can from you know culture plates all the way to you know uh, those giant vol the, the bioreactors with giant volumes and the end and at the end of the day the antibodies are purified and the, assessed for the ac uh, activity using appropriate tests <clears throat> So um, I would like to break this core process down to its, uh, you know, to its uh, different parts and uh, talk about um, and talk about them uh, separately. So first, I would like to talk about the uh, um, the initial step in this process, which after obtaining the antibodies is what we can do um, in terms of construct design to make sure uh, that we will be able to produce a um, fully functional antibody. So um, <clears throat> the antibody molecule contains the variable region, constant region, um, which also bears uh, two major sites of, of glycan. So because they're secreted uh, molecules, uh, so they we would have to add signal peptides to the end terminus of both the light chain and the heavy chain to uh, facilitate uh, the secretion. And with the variable region, we can produce a full-length antibody, of course, but we, we can also um, just take that part and uh, make it into a uh, smaller version, um, a process we call the miniaturization. Um, so we can generate single-chain SCFVs for it, uh, from, from this part. <coughs> And there are several uh, factors that we would, I would like to uh, uh, discuss in terms of a uh, uh, SCFV uh, construct. And the antibody, like I mentioned earlier, is a glycoprotein, so the glycan, uh, so the glycan Im can impact its functionalities and it can be modulated. So uh, we will take a look at these three different aspects in terms of the antibody construct um, on the, on this slide. So first of all, signal peptides. So here is a list of signal peptides that we use quite often in terms of uh, antibody and protein expression. Uh, the ones highlighted in red are <clears throat> commonly used for antibody expression. Uh, please note that you know these signal peptides are also suitable for expression of uh, SCFVs or VHH antibodies and so on. Um, and they do have an impact on the yield of antibody, as indicated in this study, uh, where I think the authors um, uh, in the first in the in the first graph they did a <clears throat> I think they did a uh, combination of different uh, signal peptides on the heavy chain and light chain, and they identified a combination that resulted in about 2.5 fold increase in the antibody yield, and uh, on the on the bottom. On the bottom chart, I think they, they did a scan, uh, did introduce the mutations to the signal peptide on the heavy chain uh, to identify you know, which residues are crucial for, uh, you know, um, for, for crucial for antibody secretion enhancement. And uh, another thing to remember is if you were trying to express a like, protein antibody fusion, uh, then you might want to choose a uh, secre uh, you know, signal peptide to, to help you to help the secretion of this molecule. And uh, this, so here's there's a list of websites, signal P6, I think it's 6.0 now. Um, this is a very useful website to help uh, determ um, to help determine the uh, you know cleavage potential of the signal peptide that you choose. <clears throat> now let's circle back to now let's circle to the uh, uh, the glycan part of the of, of the antibody. So the core fucos can um, modulate the ADCC functionalities of antibodies. So uh, I think one way to enhance ADCC function is to remove this um, <coughs> uh, fucose residues, and this can be achieved using fucose eight double knockout uh, eight hex two ninety three or Cho cell lines. The antibody is expressed using regular hex two ninety three or the Fucose 8 double knockout. HEC 293 doesn't sh show too much of a difference in terms of their uh, SEC profile. And however, if we uh, examine the uh, molecular <coughs> uh, 
uh, the, the molecules a little bit more in, in a little bit more detail using mass spec, we can see the difference in their uh, in their molecular weights. So this is uh, so the uh, fuc eight FUT8 double knockout cell lines is the way to achieve a fuel cosylated antibody and for ADCC enhancement. Now let's come to the, the miniaturization process. So in order to convert a variable regions of the of the antibody into a SCFV, uh, there are several things that we would need to consider. The so first is the linker, you know, what kind of linker we want to use and the, the length of the linker as well. And, uh, and you know what kind of purification tax that we would like to put on this construct, and uh, sometimes we also would have to add some accessories to um, to facilitate other type of functionalities, uh, which I'll show in the, in the case a little bit later. So uh, in this um, paper, uh, the authors investigated the length of the linker uh, and to identify their in impact of the you know the activity of the SCF3 molecule, and I think what they found is that the linker has to you know exceed certain lengths. So for instance, uh, 15 amino acids, uh, three repeats of this GGGS linker, uh, should <clears throat> adequately uh, ensure on the, uh, of the the functionality of the of the SCFV. While if the linker is too short. Uh, then um, sometimes the functions of the molecule can be um, somehow compromised. <clears throat> and here is an example of one of our previous uh, projects, which I would like to emphasize that um, it, it will, uh, we will touch bases on these accessories. So for instance, uh, the goal of this project was to express the SCFV HISP tag to SCFV with an AVI tag and uh, to achieve, you know, in vivo in vivo biotinylation, uh, but the first construct uh, we produce is a low yield uh, with low biotinylation ratio, and uh, it, it showed a <clears throat> great extent of aggregations. So as an optimization, uh, we added a spacer between the his tag <coughs> and AVI tag, uh, which you can see um, improved the yield um, about tenfold, twelvefold, and also improve the biotinylation ratio as well, and reduce the aggregation um, to only about 10% oligomer. So the spacer does help <coughs> stabilize our um, our molecule. And the last uh, and another attempt is that we replace the his tag and the spacer with an FC tag in order to put more space between you know the the SCFV and the AVI. Uh, AVI tag, uh, and the, the yield improved more significantly to larger than 25 mg per liter, and also the biotinylation ratio is secured at 0.9, and we only observed about like 5% aggregations. So what kind of tags you put, uh, and uh, how to rearrange these tags, how to arrange these tags, or if you would like to, you know, insert any other you know accessories between between the tags uh, can indeed impact the you know the final performance of the of, of the the molecule that you produce so um i we would encourage to uh, uh to to you know design you know multiple constructs in order to find one or a few um that are uh, that can result in um uh, a most stable molecule with uh, with decent yield. So there are several things we can do to the um, to the construct of the molecule uh, to, of the of the antibody to facilitate its expression, but we can also introduce modifications to the FC domain of the antibody um, to uh, either enhance its stability or you know add on um, additional functionalities. Uh, I'll show uh, a few cases uh, on this slide regarding FC modifications. So uh, the first case uh, is about to introduce uh, system mutations so that we will have some uh, orthogonal conjugation sites on the FC domain. So um, I think what the authors did was um, they <coughs> scanned the uh, uh, spatial aggregation propensity of the FC domain and identified a site on the CH3 region um, that is um, that has uh, the low I think that has a relatively low potential for 
<coughs> uh, for protein aggregation, mutated that to cysteine residue, and which resulted in this um, V10 construct, uh, which uh, this construct expressed at a comparable uh, yield to uh, compared to the wild type, and it also had a good monomeric dis uh, uh, monomeric con content content uh, in the in the fine in the in the pro uh, in the antibody product, which is important because uh, you know sometimes uh, the addition of cysteine residues uh, can uh, cause um, unwanted aggregations. And these um, uh, this uh, antibody can be selectively uh, labeled at the at the at the CH3 region by their fluorescent assays. Uh, <clears throat> so this is one example of how we can uh, modify FC region to um, insert or install some uh, uh, conjug um, conjugation sites here to achieve site-specific conjugations. While FC is also uh, <clears throat> modifications on FC is also important to um, enhance the stability of this of uh, either antibody or FC fusion molecules, as one example shown here. Um, the story uh, about the uh, about this case is that people find. Um, there are some indigenous instabilities in some antibodies or you know FC fusion proteins, which will result in the cleavage of the uh, FC tag, as indicated by the arrow here. <clears throat> you know, after long storage, uh, they discovered that the FC tag kind of falls off. You know, at least some of them, and they contributed this phenomenon to the. Uh, uh, atmosphere oxygen uh, gets involved um, and creates uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, and uh, <clears throat> which attacks the uh, hinge region and result in this cleavage. Uh, so what they did to um, remedy this issue is they introduced a mutation into the hinge region, and upon the introduction of this mutation, um, this problem was uh, greatly uh, was was. Uh, somehow resolved, and uh, um, the uh, <clears throat> the degradation of FC was uh, uh, successfully uh, prevented. And we also did a similar uh, trial uh, <clears throat> ourselves. So we expressed a FC fusion protein. Um, we substituted. Uh, we introduced this substitution, and uh, as you can see, um, uh, the uh, for the <clears throat> the wild type FC, um, there are about 30 percent. Uh, FC cleavage, but uh, this uh, after this uh, the introduction of this mutation, um, the FC cleavage was um, significantly reduced, and this mutation was not uh, and does not impact in um, for the FC in terms of uh, its functionality at least in the uh, Western blot assay. So <clears throat> this is a, uh, a mutation that worth considering if you do ob observe, um, you know, the fall off of the uh, FC tag in your construct. All right, last case would be um, to introduce um, cysteine pairs uh, in the uh, FC region that forms uh, intramolecular disulfide bonds to solidify um, this region um, so that you, we can have an enhanced stability. Uh, of the of the construct, so in this paper, the authors uh, introduced uh, actually two pairs of uh, cysteine residues into either the CH2 domain or the CH3 domain. Uh, the antibodies were made, and uh, they were um, actually the FC fusion proteins that were made, uh, and um, at similar I think at similar expression level, and uh, they showed similar functionality, uh, similar secondary structures. Uh, judging by the CD spectra, as well as a similar uh, interaction with uh, the uh, corresponding FC receptors. Uh, however, uh, the difference uh, shows when um, these molecules were, subje were subjected uh, to heating. So once they uh, were heated up to 60 degrees, uh, you can see that uh, FC the, the FC domains with um, this CH3 pairs uh, disulfide bound uh, disulfide bounds uh, exerted a an extent a dis extended uh, stability comparing to the wild type as well as the one with only the CH2 uh, cysteine part uh, cysteine pairs. So this is also a um, useful technique 
um, to uh, help improve the stability of your antibody or your uh, FZ fusion proteins. Now, once we have the we have the constructs all settled, then um, the next thing we would need to consider is what kind of a uh, what kind of a culture conditions that we would need to subject uh, our own constructs to uh, in order to uh, to have an optimized out, uh, optimized out outcome in terms of their expression. Uh, I think the first thing would be um, the expression vectors. So every company, I think, will have uh, their own optimized vectors to you know to go with their transfection reagent as well as their culture media. Uh, so we, as uh, so biological, we have the uh, we have also also our proprietary. Um, expression vectors uh, which you can see uh, it outperforms uh, some commercially available um, vectors um, in terms of uh, antibody yield so once the uh, the constructs are inserted into the expression vectors uh, the expression vectors were are were then uh, transfected into host cells um, by a pi mediated transfection uh, so PEIs are essentially these uh, positively charged polymers that, they, that are used to encapsulate uh, the negatively charged DNA molecules, which are the plasmids, and help to you know deliver these uh, deliver the plasmid into the host cells and more preferably into the host cell nucleus. Uh, a an efficient transfection reagent um, will um, greatly help. And ensure the success of your <clears throat> uh, of your exp uh, recombinant antibody expression work. So um, you you would uh, want to uh, select one that works um, you know best for your system. And then it comes to the culture um, the culture conditions. Uh, so of course you know culture media plays a significant role. Uh, in, in this process, but also there are other uh, parameters uh, that we can make adjustment to. So, for instance, the culture duration, uh, the culture temperature, and if w and some additives that can also be added into the culture to you know boost uh, the protein yield or to uh, uh, to um, <clears throat> reduce protein aggregation or degradation and so on. So here I would like to um, actually show you a case about you know our uh, about our previous uh, our recent um, campaign to in order to uh, look for a best combination of transfection reagent and culture media to enhance an, you know antibody expression. So for this work, we selected 20 low expression antibodies um, whose expression levels were below 20 milligrams per liter and we optimized by um, taking two uh, culture media recipes uh, M1 which is the um, the ones that we're currently using right now and M2 which is a modified uh, which is a modified version and based on M1 and we also took you know two uh, transfection reagent formulas and T1 and T2. T1 is the original version. T2 is the uh, uh, updated version. So we kept the culture volume the same, the duration, and we, the temperature. We kept all these parameters the same, and we just want to, uh, you know, investigate uh, what kind of impact of the uh, the combination of culture media and uh, transfection reagent will have on the yield of the uh, of these uh, 20 low expression antibodies. So the results shown here, you can see clearly that uh, um, <clears throat> the, com the combination of M2 and T2, which are the uh, updated version, as uh, they do result in the uh, um, increase in antibody yield for all tested antibodies. And we then took a uh, closer look um, and tried to find a correlation between uh, transfection efficiency and antibody yield and we uh, you know in this you know, GFP assay and you can you know it's depicted here uh, you can see that when we use this M2T2 combination we observed a, a significantly more um, uh, strong GFP signaled uh, cells when compared to the uh, M1T2 formula uh, 
<clears throat> M1T2 combination, uh, which actually um, um, it indicates the uh, the more efficient the uh, transfection, um, the higher yield you will have for your you know recombinant antibody. So I think the take home message on this slide is um, <clears throat> uh, we you uh, you would want to you know optimize the uh, culture system and especially uh, the choice of transfection reagent and the culture intermediate in order to uh, you know achieve a uh, maximum yield of your recombinant antibody. Now once the antibody is cultured, um, the, I think the last step will be to purify the antibodies from you know their culture media. So the purification will follow this scheme. We have the crude sample, we try to capture the antibodies somehow and then we um, and then we polish them using you know different methods. But lucky for us, antibodies do have uh, antibodies have the FC region, and the FC regions are considered as a uh, you know quote unquote endogenous affinity purification tag. So there are you know different proteins, especially protein A and protein G, derived from uh, bacteria. They specifically recognize um, the FC FC region, and uh, uh, these proteins are routinely used to serve as affinity purification tag for antibodies or, you know, FC fusion proteins. And for some antibodies, if their if their uh, light chain is in the kappa format, then another <coughs> affinity approach, protein L, can also be used um, to selectively uh, purify um, these antibodies. Uh, however, if you have only a, like a fragment of the antibody, or your antibodies contain some mutations that uh, prevents the interaction with protein A or protein G, then we can simply just treat the antibody as a recombinant protein and purify it um, using a combination of chromatography methods. So uh, here I would like just to give a quick shout out to this web tool. Uh, it's called the Prot uh, PI Calculator. Uh, it can help you, uh, you know, calculate um, the uh, PI or molecular weight um, <clears throat> uh, and other, you know, uh, parameters. Um, but and by introducing, um, you know, by introducing subunits, so which is kind of kind of kind of useful um, to you know figure out what kind of per, um, to figure out the status, the physical status of the uh, of the antibody of interest and uh, and plan your purification work um, accordingly. So I here I would like to showcase a um, previous study that we did. Uh, that we, did. Uh, we made a uh, bispecific antibody for a client uh, and the, the first step of pure protein A purification did capture <coughs> uh, the majority of the of the antibody. However, we do observe a uh, we do observe some uh, Content in the format of a, a ligamer, and then we um, performed two um, consecutive steps of purification and iron exchange, as well as a gel filtration. And after these two steps, we reduced the oligomer content uh, to about less than five percent. So I think the take-home message for this slide is that you know antibodies are relatively easy to to work with because of their affinity tag, uh, but sometimes uh, other um, uh, purification steps are required in order to um, you know refine the quality um, the quality of your antibodies. Okay, I think pre uh, on the previous slides, and uh, I think we were talking about what we were talking about are uh, either full-length IgG type of antibodies or uh, antibody or fragmented antibodies. Um, however, uh, IgMs are I think they're um, <clears throat> becoming more and more trendy these days because you know they're either a pentamer or a hexamer, and because you know they're uh, multiple valencies, um, I think. Um, people, especially I think in the uh, uh, IVD industry, are paying more and more attention to these formats of antibodies. You know, because of their uh, multiple avidities, it could uh, increase the sensitivity of their assay. Uh, and IgMs can also be uh, be produced using uh, recombinant expression <coughs> technique. 
So for um, for the Pentamer format, it, which means that it has an uh, has a J chain to you know, help help facilitate the formation of the Pentamer, uh, we can normally use two um, transfection methods to uh, obtain uh, a uh, a pure IgM in the uh, corrected uh, in the correct Pentamer uh, format. And also, um, the the hexamer uh, IgM without the J chain can also be uh, achieved as well using um, uh, using similar approach using similar approaches. <clears throat> However, uh, I would like to mention that you know the because of their size uh, and their oligomeric state status, um, the purification of IgMs could be a little bit trickier. So if you have an IgM and it has a kappa Li chain, then uh, we can use protein L affinity <clears throat> to serve as a, uh, the, the first step of purification um, to help capture um, to help capture the antibody. And then we can use a, uh, a second uh, purification step. Uh, I think in this case we use the gel filtration. Uh, to remove the uh, uh, smaller molecular contaminants and uh, to and, and enrich the uh, uh, the pentamer and the pe the pentameric uh, and the pentameric format of the antibody. However, <clears throat> if your antibody does not have a uh, kappa Li chain, um, then you know of course there are uh, purification matrices available um, that. Uh, that specifically recognize and uh, uh, you know IgM framework, uh, but they could uh, be you know somehow costly. So for us, what we do is we treat uh, you know an IgM as a recombinant protein. So we use a combination of different chromatography steps um, to obtain a purified version of the molecule. So I think in this case we took two step approach uh, the first in the night exchange uh, followed by a gel filtration and you can see after the, the two steps we can also uh, purify an antibody with uh, larger than 95 percent purity so um, so the take home is IgM can also be produced using similar approaches but their um, purification may be a little bit trickier you know because of their sizes Okay, lastly, I would like also to take this opportunity to um, <clears throat> uh, give you guys a brief introduction or in a brief quick overview to our high throughput antibody or high throughput protein expression platform. So what it, how, uh, how it works is that uh, we can collect an antibody sequence library from, from a client and we design, uh, we design primers according to the sequences of the antibody and uh, uh, then, then we will uh, subject these design to high throughput primer um, and uh, primer synthesize and vector uh, vector synthesize. So these are kind of automated and process. And once we have these uh, vectors, um, we transfect a array of HEC293 cell culture um, <clears throat> in the in the format of shaker uh, shaker flasks. And at the end of the culture duration, uh, we took a um, we used a protein A affinity column to perform a one-step purification. Uh, normally, we can get an up to 90% pure pure antibodies, and we can um, then subject them to um, function validations. In this case, an ELISA assay, and select a few um, ones with the desired uh, functionalities, and go to the uh, to the scale up process. So we use uh, this shaker flask plat uh, platform because you know the the yield uh, results from this um, this culture method is more relatable to the uh, uh, to the final scale up. Um, <clears throat> we have performed uh, actually a f several projects using this platform and uh, we have generated uh, over I think 6,000 antibodies. Um, I think to this day. So I want to show you two uh, cases. Uh, so the first one is we helped a group um, to create uh, to create a library of um, uh, antibodies against COVID-19, and uh, um, 
uh, we express these antibodies full length, uh, full length human IgG1, I believe, uh, using this platform, and the <clears throat> uh, and our collaborators identified 14 neutralizing antibodies in this within this library, and we scaled up the production and create and, and generated uh, 10 to 30, 300 milligrams of the material, and they used these antibodies for structural analyses and animal studies, and the the results were published in Cell in 2020. And not long ago, we also did a uh, customer uh, VHH antibody library generation. The size is a little bit smaller. We uh, <clears throat> made 72, uh, 74 antibodies, all in the format of VHH FC fusion. And all the antibodies are produced successfully. And after one step purification, uh, we get a average yield about 50 mg per mil, uh, per liter, sorry. And uh, also in the SEC uh, monomeric purity at about 95%. So, uh, so this system has been proven to be uh, quite robust and uh, efficient in produce both um, full-length IgG antibodies as well as VHH, uh, the VHH variant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to sum up, uh, so antibodies are essential molecules. Uh, they're um, a very uh, they're they're very versatilely uh, they they have versatile functions and they can be used uh, in um, a lot of research areas in the in the life science realm and they can be derived from you know various methods and uh, but uh, um, the massive production is usually achieved by recombinant expression which was the uh, uh, the main topic of our um, discussion today. And they can be engineered into different formats, and we we prefer to use mammalian cell lines as expression host. And the uh, antibody uh, and the expression of an antibody can be optimized at you know different steps during the process, uh, from the initial construct design all the way to the selection of the most suitable uh, culture methods and purification strategies. And of course, this high throughput. Uh, platform is uh, quite powerful, and it enables the pur uh, the production of both full length as well as VHH uh, <clears throat> fusion format of antibodies. Um, and we would hope to uh, you know using this platform uh, more and more in the future um, to help um, clients create their you know uh, antibody libraries. So with that, I would like to um, I would like to conclude this presentation. Um, thank you for taking the time to attend uh, our seminar. And <clears throat> here is uh, here are our uh, contact information. You can reach us either by phone or by email uh, or by scanning this QR code. Um, with that, um, again, thank you for your time, and I would be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Chen, for the fantastic presentation today. Uh, and with that, we'll move right on to the Q&A. Um, so let's kick things off with an interesting question here. Uh, what are the major differences between uh, recombinant antibodies expressed by HEK293 cells and CHO cells? So uh, I think, uh, from my understanding, is, you know, because these two cell lines, even though they're both mammalian cell lines, but they're derived from different sources. Uh, the HEC-293 is derived from a human source, while the CHO is derived from a, uh, uh, a, 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 a rodent, uh, which is a, a hamster. So uh, because of their difference in origins, that would, means that these cells are different in terms of their glycosyl transferase profiles and uh, expression levels. So I think the one major differences between uh, the antibodies produced by these cell lines will uh, lie in the, uh, the, structure, uh, the structure of the glycan, uh, especially I think the terminal sialic acid uh, decorations. Uh, the HEC-293 and the uh, CHO will have different levels of sialic acid uh, sialic acid levels in their antibody glycan and these sialic acids might be you know connected to the glycan backbone via different linkages and some uh, some of sometimes these could be um, uh, these could be some issues are uh, in uh, some of the assays fantastic um, and as a, a follow-up to that question what are the um, 
or since since the FC glycans seem to contribute to the heterogeneities of recombinant anti antibodies, um, how about just removing the glycan chains? Yeah, that's certainly a um, that's certainly a, a way to you know uh, get around this issue, uh, uh, for that matter. Uh, however, uh, uh, I would encourage uh, everyone to remember that um, the glycans are there for a reason. Uh, they're associated with effector functions, and also in the meantime, um, you know, these glycans c could add a uh, level of hydrophilicity to the uh, to the to the whole antibody molecule. So if we just you know abruptly remove the glycans. Um, we, we can still be, we will still be able to produce these antibodies, but uh, <clears throat> I think um, without this these glycan shields, um, you know these antibodies might be less stable uh, than the glycosylated version. So um, I think in in short answer is yes, we can just you know remove the glycans by do, introducing uh, introducing single amino acid mutations. Um, uh, but you know, glycans are important indeed. So um, we, I would, <clears throat> I think it's still better to you know to 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 keep them there. But you know, find other ways, per, perhaps through some form of uh, you know glycan engineering, uh, to reduce the heterogeneity or to uh, make the you know glycan chain of an antibody produced in the Cho cell line as similar as to that of a you know uh, as to those produced by a, human B cells or human cell lines as possible. Yeah, some really great points there. Um, shifting gears a little bit, how do you choose a suitable buffer for recombinant <laughs> antibodies? Uh, that's a, actually a very uh, good question. And it's something that we uh, encounter, um, you know, from time, all, all, all the time, actually. Uh, so, but I think it all boils down to two points. So, uh, in order for buffer, in order for buffer to be suitable for an antibody, we would need to consider, you know, the compatibility with the follow-up assay, as well as as well as the stability uh, of the antibody, you know, within this buffer. Um, so, I think I know that a lot of people use PPS buffer, and uh, because it's a uh, you know quote unquote physiological buffer, uh, it does have a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, however, we do we, we do observe you know sometimes antibodies are not stable in PBS buffer, and then in this case, then we will have to um, you know either switch a buffer base, for instance, using tris based buffer, or e even like other uh, uh, physiological buffers such as MES or heaps, you know, based on the stability of the antibody. And also uh, sometimes we would consider you know putting some additives into the system, uh, for instance, glyc. Uh, glass row is uh, like the most common additives and it has proven to be you know least problematic of the many and uh, um, other you know ad additives including some uh, sugar residues or uh, 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 or some you know a, a small amount of detergent can also can sometimes also be introduced um, however, uh, the, the basis for selecting these additives or for selecting the basis of the buffer is have to, you have to make sure that whatever you put in in the uh, you know in, into the system is not going to be is not going to interfere with your you know downstream assays or applications. So, for instance, if you want to uh, make modif chemical modifications to the antibody, then probably a trace based buffer is not going to be very uh, suitable. Uh, since you know most of the modifications are done uh, using the lysine residues, and the trace buffer has uh, a primary amine that can you know interfere with these reactions. Um, so yeah, so uh, I think a suitable buffer is a buffer that is um, ensures the stability of the antibody and ensures the uh, you know assay or application compatible uh, compatibility uh, for for the downstream processes. Excellent. Yeah, another great answer there. Um, and I think in the interest of time, we'll just make this next question uh, the last one, and it'll be a, a double here. Uh, do you have a favorite format of recombinant antibody? And uh, what format do you think is the most challenging to make? <laughs> okay, um, to pick a favorite. Um, well, I mean, every antibody is unique, even though, you know, even for the IgG1, sometimes we do um, see, you know, strange behaviors. Uh, between you know different preparations or you know between different constructs. Uh, if I would have to, uh, I think I'll answer the second part. 
Uh, I think for the antibodies that we've made so far, uh, the IgMs are definitely uh, considered as most challenging because, you know, they're huge molecules to begin with. And we have to ensure their, uh, um, ensure their purity as well as the, you know, ensure that to make sure that they reach uh, correct aggregations, uh, uh, what is it, aggregation, oligomer oligomerization status, and that's a more appropriate word. Um, so which means uh, it will uh, be a little bit more, a little bit more challenging to, to, pure, uh, to both produce and purify these proteins. Um, so that being said, I could also say that uh, at least for now, uh, my favorite format will be IgM because, you know, they do give us uh, a challenge and, uh, you know, we do like a good challenge as well. Excellent. Um, well, thanks so much, Dr. Chen, for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. Thank you. A big thanks uh, also to the audience here for participating. And last but not least, we'd also like to thank the sponsor, Sinobiological. Um, and in closing, we hope you enjoyed this scientist.com webinar, and we'll see you again next time.